In this video, let's talk about the quantitative aspect of the FRM curriculum and the FRM exam. Specifically, let's try and answer these three frequently asked questions. What kind of math appears in the FRM curriculum? How is this math actually tested in the exam? And how can you, the candidate, approach the math in the curriculum? Or let's say, what's the best strategy to deal with the more quantitatively heavier areas of the FRM curriculum? Okay, let's begin with question one. For us to be able to understand what kind of math appears in the FRM curriculum, let's sample a few formulas which appear in the FRM part one curriculum and also, let's say, in the FRM part two curriculum. From these formulas, we can actually create a list of math topics, or let's say math areas, which the creators of the FRM curriculum assume that you have a working knowledge of. Okay, to start on the simplest note, let's talk about actually simple algebra. You need to know how to solve simple equations and simple inequalities involving a single variable. You need to know how to calculate simple means, arithmetic mean and geometric mean. You need to know how to calculate weighted averages. You need to be familiar with the properties of the summation operator as well as the product operator. Okay, then moving on, you need to have good working knowledge of functions of a single variable. Okay, you need to be well aware of the definitions of the more popular functions that you will encounter. Functions such as the linear function, I mean straight line, quadratic function, then exponential function, and let's say also the natural log function. Okay, you need to know how to solve simple equations which involve the exponential function or let's say the logarithmic function. Okay, also, you need to understand how inverse functions work. Okay, then you need to have at least a working knowledge of differentiation and integration which involve a function of a single variable. Okay, then you need to understand how differentials work, how simple differential equations work, and maybe also how simple stochastic differential equations work. Okay, then you need to have working knowledge of functions of multiple variables. You need to understand and you need to be able to interpret what's a partial derivative. Okay, and lastly, you need to have some knowledge of basic linear algebra. Okay, you need to understand how a row vector works, how a column vector works, what's the meaning of a transpose, what's the meaning of the inverse of a matrix, and how matrix multiplication works. Okay, so this is the list of math topics which I have just now created for you. Okay, this is as far as question one one is concerned. Now let's move on to question number two. How is this math actually tested in the exam? Now a lot of the math areas which you might truly speaking label as troublesome, these math areas they actually work behind the scenes and these are not explicitly tested in the exam. Okay, here I'm talking about those math areas which actually help you transition from one point in the curriculum to another point. Okay, these are math areas which help you go through all the steps that take you from point A to point B. Now, these areas will not be tested in the exam. What you will be tested on actually is you know, on how well you can interpret, understand and apply the final results which are presented to you in the curriculum. Let me give you a couple of examples. Let's say I were to tell you that for a fixed income security which pays you a stream of cash flows denoted by CI 
at these times Ti, the theoretical fair price of this security, assuming a flat continuously compounded discount rate Y, is given by this formula. Okay. Alongside, let me introduce to you this interest rate risk measure called the duration and the formula or let's say the definition of duration looks something like this. It's the negated value of the relative rate of change of P with respect to Y. Okay. Now, this is the point A which I was referring to. Now, from this point A, using simple differentiation, you can arrive at this point B, which tells you that for this situation, D, it works out to this particular formula. Okay, so what takes you from point A to point B is neither mentioned in the curriculum, nor will it be tested in the exam. What you will be tested on is how well you understand this final result and how well you can interpret and apply it in the exam. Okay, either let's say as a direct calculation or let's say as a starting point to arrive at other rules of thumb which you have to keep in mind. Rules of thumb for let's say for example related to the duration of a zero coupon bond. Or for example, how this duration varies with the pattern of these cash flows and also, let's say, with the time to maturity of your fixed income instrument. Okay, let me give you another example. Let's say if I were to tell you that for a stock, the return over a tiny time period delta T is assumed to be normally distributed with this as the mean and this as the variance. This is your point A. Now, from this point A, the curriculum jumps to this point B without taking you through all the steps required to do so. Okay, What you will be tested on is how well you understand and interpret this final result. This result tells me that the natural log of the ratio of the stock price T years from today to the stock price as of today is normally distributed with this as the mean and this as the variance. Now, in the exam, what you will be tested on is let's say how well you can apply this particular result to calculate a probability associated with this ST or for let's for example, let's say how well you can use this result to create a confidence interval for this ST. Okay, so as far as this question 2 is concerned, remember this that a lot of the math, it helps you transition from point A to point B. Knowledge of this math is awesome if you want to build a solid understanding of the FRM curriculum. But if you are purely focused on the FRM exam only, then what matters is how well you understand the final results which are given in the curriculum. Okay. Let's now move on to question number three, which is all about what should your approach be. Let's start with the math that is required purely from the curriculum perspective. What you can do is that you can go back to that list of math topics that we had created and you can actually categorize these math topics into actually three different categories. In category one, I would include all those topics which are absolutely essential for the FRM exam. Okay, These are topics which you need to know before you even begin on the FRM curriculum. Okay, In this category, I would include simple algebra. I would include, let's say, good working knowledge of single variable functions. Okay, Then, in category 2, I would include all those topics which even if you don't have a working knowledge of, you will still be good to go if you have proper fallbacks in place. In this category, I would include, for example, simple differentiation, integration, and maybe even simple linear algebra. Okay, If, let's say, you do not have working knowledge of differentiation, but you intuitively understand what's the meaning of 
the derivative of a function f with respect to x. If you intuitively understand that the derivative is nothing but a rate of change, it's nothing but a sensitivity kind of measure, and if you know how to calculate, numerically speaking, the derivative of f with respect to x, you are good to go. Okay. Similarly, for integration, if you understand this, that the integral of f with respect to x is nothing but the area underneath the plot of f, or for that matter, let's say, if you were to understand that integration is nothing but, in a limiting sense, a sum, you are good to go. Okay, then if you don't have working knowledge of let's say linear algebra and if I present to you a formula which is written in a very compact manner using for example matrix multiplication, well what you can do is that you can very well memorize the formula which you get by actually expanding out the product of the matrices involved. Okay, so this is my category 2. In category 3, I would include all those topics which I am expecting you will be exposed to the first time when you actually pick the FRM curriculum. Okay, So in this category, I would include topics such as, let's say, homogeneous functions, convex versus non-convex functions, Jensen's inequality, Taylor series expansions, etc. Okay, so if you categorize these math topics into these three categories and if let's say you are good to go as far as category 1 and category 2 are concerned by all means start working on the FRM curriculum okay topics which come up as far as this category is concerned can always be worked upon when you first encounter those topics okay then the second tip is to always maintain an exam orientation if in the short run your main goal, your focus is to clear the FRM exam. When you pick any given section of the curriculum, the first thing you should do is to go and check what's the learning objective for this particular section. How is the learning objective phrased? What is the action keyword in that learning objective? Is it calculate or let's say is it describe if it's a calculate learning objective you should know how to correctly apply any given final result in this section to a wide variety of numericals okay so do expose yourself to a wide variety of questions to a wide variety of numericals so you are well equipped to apply this particular learning objective correctly in an exam setting okay so for these learning objectives practice does really help you a lot okay then if it's a described learning objective although it's a quantitative one but still it's a described learning objective make sure that you are able to intuitively understand the final result really well and you're able to interpret the result as well as you can Okay, at least to an extent that you can use the final result of this section to reason out or let's say derive other rules of thumb which depend on this particular final result. Okay, then let's move on to the next tip and this is about notation. If you encounter any given section which seems to be heavy on math notation, then remember this that heavy notation does not really always translate to that particular section being math heavy. Heavy notation is not the same as being math heavy. Okay, So when you encounter a section which uses heavy math notation, always try and verbalize what is being presented to you. Try and read what is being presented to you in plain and simple English language. It will really help you understand what's given there. Okay, so verbalizing helps a lot. Also, when it comes to notation, if you are aiming for full conceptual clarity, make sure that you are as consistent with your notation as possible. Okay, for example, if let's say you denote level of confidence as a C and level of significance as alpha, make sure that 
in every situation where you are to encounter a level of confidence and a level of significance, you consistently use C for confidence and alpha for level of significance. Don't use them interchangeably. Okay? Then, the last tip is to pay an extra focus on building blocks. There are quite a few concepts which appear time and again across the part 1 and the part 2 curriculum. Okay, but they may appear in different situations and in different contexts. Now, for these particular concepts, you know, I would love to call them as building blocks because of the way that they cross apply across many different situations. For these building blocks, whenever you encounter them the first time, make sure that you understand them really well because it will make your task really simple when you encounter them again and again in the curriculum. Let me give you two examples. Well, in the beginning of the quant analysis book, you will be presented with this result about the variance of, let's say, a weighted sum of random variables. If you understand this particular result, this particular concept really well the first time, you can easily cross apply this particular concept in many different situations. For example, a situation where you have to calculate the variance of the return of a basket of stocks. For example, a situation where you have to calculate the variance of the loss coming from a portfolio of loans. Or let's say you have to calculate the VAR of a position which is let's say exposed to multiple risk factors. Okay, then second example, Taylor series expansion. So if you understand Taylor series expansion really well, then you can easily apply it to different situations. For example, situation one, you have to write down how the price of a bond is impacted when the yield changes. Okay, it's a situation where you use Taylor series expansions. Secondly, let's say you have to write down what's the PNL of an option position when, let's say, any of the determinants which determine the value of the option were to change. For example, time changes. For example, the underlying asset price changes. Or let's say, for example, the volatility changes. Okay, so for this situation also, Taylor series expansion comes in handy. Okay, so this video was all about understanding the quantitative aspect of both the FRM curriculum and the FRM exam and a few tips that I hope will help you do the most amount of justice to the quantitatively heavier sections of the FRM curriculum. Okay?